Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. The first of the three sketches that Albert Camus is going to provide us with in part two of the myth of Sisyphus is the character Don Juan. Now he stresses that he's not doing a literary analysis. As a matter of fact, at one point he says, I shall barely have recourse to the legend. So this is a reconstruction on his own part of what he thinks is really key to this quite attractive character, at least attractive to playwrights and people who want to incorporate him. And he starts out with a set of general observations. He says, if it were sufficient to love, things would be too easy. The more one loves, the stronger the absurd goes. Now that's a remark that goes beyond the character Don Juan and can apply to all of us if we do get ourselves involved in, as so many of us do, the desire, the commitments, the act, all the other things that figure into this, this matter that we call love, then we create an opening for the absurd to make its way into our life. And this might actually be the entry point for some people. Now, in the case of Don Juan, he is a legendary seducer of women. He goes from woman to woman to woman, seducing and having sex with them. And in a certain sense, consuming them, consuming the love that they are exhibiting towards him the love that he bestows upon them, but only for a certain time. So he's got some interesting speculations here about Don Juan. He says, it is not through lack of love that Don Juan goes from woman to woman. It's ridiculous to represent him as a mystic in quest of total love. So these are wrong approaches. And then he says, it is indeed because he loves them with the same passion and each time with his whole self. So this is telling us about, you know, what he's actually like. Now it's because of this, Camus says, that he must repeat his gift and his profound quest. There is a sort of incompleteness in the completion of love that leads him to not stay with one person, but to move on to another and to engage in repetition. And so he's, he goes on and says, each woman hopes to give him what no one has ever given him. Each time they're utterly wrong and merely manage to make him feel the need of that repetition. At last exclaims one of them, I have given you love. Can we be surprised that Don Juan laughs at this? At last, he says, no, but once more. And then Camus finishes that little introductory paragraph with this remark, why should it be essential to love rarely in order to love much? And this is, you know, fitting in with what he calls earlier an ethics of quantity rather than one, uh, as we're going to see, of, of quality. Then he somewhat changes topic. He asks, is Don Juan, and the translation here is, is he melancholy? I mean, the French is a little bit more straightforward. Triste, sad. Is he a sad person? We could say melancholy because it's a, often a synonym for sadness. And he says, no, not likely. So he's not sad as, you know, his overarching mood. That's not where the motivation is coming from. 
and he's not sad all that often in you know a sort of more punctuated sense. And why not? So Camus says that every healthy creature tends to multiply itself, so it is with Don Juan, but melancholy people have two reasons for being so. They don't know or they hope. And you might say, well, why the hell would hope make you melancholy? Well, you know, because in your action of hoping, you know that you're going beyond the reality that you're confronted with and you could be let down, right? And you don't know and hope kind of go to, together. And he says, Don Juan is the opposite of this. He knows and he does not hope. And then he's got this interesting comparison. He says, Don Juan is like an artist. So he's not saying he is an artist. He's like an artist who knows his limits, never go beyond them. And in that precarious uh, interval in which they take their spiritual stand, enjoy all the wonderful ease of masters. And he says, that is indeed genius, the intelligence that knows its frontiers. So if you can confine yourself to this world, this life, what it is that you have in front of you and perhaps in the immediate future, then you can actually enjoy more freedom, more enjoyment, more happiness. You can't do so by simply doing something and then sticking with that forever. You have to engage as Don Juan does in a kind of repetition. And we see that he's also unconcerned, as he says, about a life beyond this one. He says, it's false to see in Don Juan a man brought up on Ecclesiastes, that biblical work that is perhaps one of the most pessimistic ones of the wisdom literature. Nothing is vanity to him except for the hope of another life. Why? He proves this. He gambles that other life against heaven itself longing for desire, killed by satisfaction, the commonplace of the impotent man does not belong to him. And Camus is going to compare him against a couple other sort of figures that are concerned with God and the devil and, and what comes next. So he moves on and says that people are sufficiently annoyed by Don Juan's speech and by the same remark that he uses on all women but to anyone who seeks quantity in his joy is the only thing that matters is efficacy. And so here he's going to talk a little bit later about this, in fact, being an ethics of quantity, right? It's not an ethics of quality like that of the, the saint. This is about having as many and as much experiences of the sort that he values as possible. And so he's going to say, Don Juan is not an immoralist, right? So he's not saying, ah, morality, I'm going to turn it on its head. I'm going to be perverse or something like that. He's just going his own way without worrying about uh, the moral code that people want to impose. And interestingly, Camus is going to say he does actually have his own moral code, but it's a moral code of likes and dislikes. So is this moral or is this aesthetic? You know, we could ask those. It, coming back to, to this, he talks about efficacy, right? The only thing that matters is efficacy. What is the use of complicating the passwords that have stood the text? What are the passwords? The formulas for seduction. But in this, there's something revealed. He talks about... Um, they are the rule, the convention, and the courtesy. He says, no one, neither the woman nor the man, listens to them, to the formulas, but rather to the voice that pronounces them. That voice, Don Juan's voice, is what is giving a rule, a convention, a courtesy in pursuit and enjoyment of the, the relations that he's having with these women. All right, so this is... a. Uh, uh, quite an interesting point of view that we can uh, ask about here. And he's also going to point out that Don Juan, some people will say, oh, he's not an ordinary seducer. Something special is happening with this. And Camus says, 
No, he is an ordinary seducer. Let's call it what it is. Uh, the ordinary seducer and the sexual athlete. Why is he a sexual athlete? Because he can have sex with so many women and you know, do so in, in a very good way for them. So, you know, we could talk about other legendary people like that. And so Camus says, you know, he is a, an ordinary seducer in the fullest sense and with all his faults, except for a key difference. What is the key difference? He's conscious. He knows what it is that he is doing and he's aware of the value of it. And he says, that's why he is absurd. A seducer who has become lucid does not change for that. They don't cease being a seducer. They're not like, oh, I've realized that seduction, sexuality, desire, all this play. Oh, it's just, you know, to go back to it. Vanity of vanities, all is vanities. No, that's not where he goes with this. He knows what he's doing. He knows the limited value of it, but he's going to pursue it anyway. So he goes on. And he says, um, it can be said at the same time, and I really love this formula, nothing has changed and everything is transformed. And then he goes on to say, what Don Juan realizes in action is the ethics of quantity, or rather an ethics of quantity, because there are many and multiple ones. Then he uh, brings up another topic. Is Don Juan selfish? We might add to it, is he a selfish bastard, right? Engaging in seduction of these women who think that they're going to give him something unique and they'll finally catch him in a lasting relationship and know he has sex with them, you know, uh, gives, gives of himself and then moves on, does not give of himself permanently. Is this selfish? And he says, well... In his way, probably, but we need to think about what this actually means. And uh, he says, the love that we're speaking of here is clothed in illusions of the eternal, but as all the specialists in passion teach us, there is no eternal love, but that which is thwarted. You're not going to have an eternal love that goes on forever, uh, just hinted at here in this life. And he says, there's scarcely any passion without struggle. Such a love culminates only in the ultimate contradiction of death. And then he talks about people who do commit themselves to one great love in their life. So he talks about uh, the cases of a mother or a passionate wife. And he says, you know, there's actually selfishness there as well. They seem to be totally devoted to the other, but that's not really the case. He says that um, Don Juan knows just as well that those who turn away from all personal life through a great love enrich themselves perhaps, but certainly impoverish those their love has chosen. Sacrificing yourself for the other, not being, you could say, properly selfish, is actually, in some respects, bad for the other. And so he says, a mother or passionate wife necessarily has a closed heart. Why? Because it is turned away from the world, a single emotion, a single creature, a single face, but all is devoured. What kind of love does Don Juan have? A different love from this, a liberating love, as Camus is going to say. And interestingly, so he's got this phrase, it brings with it all the faces in the world and its tremor comes from the fact that it knows itself to be mortal. Two important sides. Now, all the faces in the world, no, just women's faces, obviously, because Don Juan, that's his, his attraction, right? But th that's still an awful lot of world out there. And so he's not going to hold himself back from any of that. For those who want to be seduced, he'll seduce you. But it's within a horizon that is imposed, a horizon of finitude, a horizon of death coming eventually, of, we could even say, futility. And he goes on and says, Don Juan has chosen to be nothing. Every conquest doesn't bring something permanent for him. It's just going through time in that way. And then Camus has a really interesting meditation here, a little bit of a digression. 
We can say, to paraphrase the, the uh, now classic song, what is love, right? And Camus will say here something really quite, quite interesting. We call love what binds us to certain creatures only by reference to a collective way of seeing for which books and legends are responsible. Our ideas about love have been informed by books and legends, but of love as an experience, I know only that mixture of desire, affection, and intelligence that binds me to this or that creature. This compound is not the same for another person. I do not have the right, he says, to cover all these experiences with the same name. And so here the absurd person multiplies again what they cannot unify. Thus they discover a new way of being, which liberates them as much as it liberates those who approach them. And he goes on and says, there's no noble love, but that which recognizes itself to be short-lived and exceptional. So Don Juan becomes a kind of stand-in for the lover of Camus present, or perhaps even our present, who is going to have affairs, pursue them fully, but not expect a lifelong, unique commitment, and may in fact have to recognize that their love is different than others. The last topic he's going to approach is that of punishment. A lot of people think this Don Juan SOB, look at him seducing everybody. There's got to be some sort of punishment in the story. And indeed, in some of the accounts, Don Juan is punished in important ways, right? So he goes on and he says, I think at this point of all those who insist that Don Juan must be punished, and where must he be punished? Not just in another life, not just he loses heaven, winds up in hell, but in this life. This lifestyle of his, it's degenerate, it's wrong-headed, it's got the wrong values. He must be punished by regret, by realizing that he's thrown his life away, by the da- you know, realizing all the carnage and damage he's left in his terrible wake. And Camus says, well, that doesn't happen with Don Juan, not the way I understand him. And he he says, you know, this doesn't preclude Don Juan thinking about things along the way, but he's going to figure it out himself, right? So he says that he's fine with ridicule, for example, and, um, you know, He says, a fate is not a punishment. Don Juan realizes his fate, but he's not actually going to be punished in this life. And he talks about what is Don Juan doing? He achieves a knowledge without illusions, which negates everything that the punishers profess, loving and possessing, conquering and consuming. That is his way of knowing. He is their worst enemy to the extent he is ignorant of them. He, you know, it's sort of like that meme where somebody is, is saying to the other one in the elevator, you know, I think lowly of you, I don't like you and all that. And then the other person turns to them and says, I don't think of you at all. And that infuriates them even more, right? So Don Juan with the moralists is, is going to be bothering them. And as we see, Uh, The earliest formulation has to do with a statue of the commander uh, that Don Juan, you know, brings in and the statue drags him down to hell. What is this statue symbolizing? He says, it's a a cold statue set in motion to punish the blood and courage that dared to think. All the powers of eternal reason, of order, of universal morality, all the foreign grandeur of a God open to wrath are summed up in him. That gigantic stone symbolizes the forces that Don Juan negated. Now he says forever, but can you really say forever in this case? You know, Don Juan is aware of his own mortality, so there is no forever really, for him. Maybe Camus is attracted to to phrases and inserts too much there. So he goes on and he says that 
The real tragedy takes place apart from these circumstances. It was not under a stone hand that Don Juan met his death. And he, he construes another story. And then he suggests that perhaps Don Juan finishes his life as an ascetic, perhaps even in a cell of one of those Spanish monasteries lost on a hilltop. And if he contemplates anything at all, it's not the ghosts of past loves, but perhaps some silent Spanish plain, a noble soulless land in which he recognizes himself. And what would this be? This would be the passing over from sensual pleasure leading into a kind of asceticism that Don Juan could in fact choose for himself. Camus says it's essential to realize that sensual pleasure and asceticism may be the two aspects of the same destination for this character. Now this is all sort of adding to the story, adding to the interpretation, but this is one sketch of the absurd person that Camus is putting forward, not saying that we should all become Don Juans or I mean, that would be quite impossible, wouldn't it? Or that any one of us has to pursue this. But he's saying this is one of the possible ways in which a person can live out an ethics of quantity in the face of the absurd.